I am hopeful and I am very confident the lot of Middle Eastern airlines will also send their planes here. I am also very confident the lot of airlines based in Southeast Asia will also use this facility for all of their aircrafts as well. This new investment is a huge endorsement for the robustness of aerospace ecosystem in Hyderabad. I am sure this will encourage other global aerospace and defense investors to choose Telangana for their Indian foray. What I am even more happy about, you know, the three things that were mentioned by Olivia today. Of course, we have the two factories that have opened today and the third investment that is announced today, MRO. He also announced a digital transformation center. Now, Hyderabad, as you all know, is an important technology hub in the country and one of the important technology hubs in the world. And with about 800 employees at the Digital Transformation Center for Safran. This makes it the fourth investment of Safran in about six years. And I think uh, our Honorable Chief Minister, Sri KCR Garu, he always says one thing. He says, your existing investor, your existing investor in your state is your biggest brand ambassador. If they are happy, they are going to continue to expand their business. They are also going to ensure that the positivity about the state's ease of doing business, the positivity about the state's way of functioning will reach every nook and corner in the world. And I think this is a resounding endorsement to the state of Telangana as Safran has announced its fourth project today. And I'm extremely thankful to you, Olivia, for your endorsement. Telangana today is the most vibrant and the happening aerospace valley in India. We have of course, the best industrial policy in the form of TSI pass with tailor-made incentives for mega projects. We have multiple world-class aerospace parks and SEZs adjacent to the outer ring road and airport. We also have large number of existing global aerospace OEMs into manufacturing and also into export. We have abundant skilled workforce and state advanced skilling partnerships. Task in partnership with Cranfield University, Aerocampus Aquitaine, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical Society has been able to create a robust think force, robust workforce which will continue to feed the aerospace and defense industry in Hyderabad in Telangana. More than 1,000 MSMEs are integrated into the aerospace and defense supply chains in Hyderabad. The focus on innovation, the focus on growing more and more innovative ideas, grooming more services and products from our state through T-Hub, T-Works, Research and Innovation Circle of Hyderabad, V-Hub, the Women Entrepreneurs Hub, all of these together will continue to keep the state in good stead in terms of providing quality resources to this industry. As I have said earlier, governments would have to be focusing on two things. One is preventive, one is preventive care and the other is curative care. And looking at this from the uh, from the lens of uh, uh, how to improve this uh, health care, one would have to be talking about availability, accessibility of health care and also affordability of health care. All these three would have to be moving in line. In order to do that, uh, from my state's perspective as to how we have, how, like, how we have been uh, uh, wanting to move forward is, we've taken every uh, 2,000 people, uh, every pop population with, uh, every village with 2,000 population as a unit, and we're coming up with uh, village clinics. Okay. And then uh, we're taking up every uh, 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 30,000 population as a unit as a, a unit and uh, uh, classifying it as mandal and where we're coming up with two PHCs, uh, primary health centers. These primary health centers would have uh, 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 four doctors, two of the doctors uh, uh, present in each of the PHC center and they would be given uh, an ambulance 104 and each of this doctor would be given their designated villages. So five villages or four villages, depending on the mandal size, to each of these doctors. And these doctors, every alternate day, would hop onto the ambulance and visit the village. 
and they would become the family doctor for that village. Very soon the doctors, because they've been de designated only those four villages, so they would start to identify people by names and they would use this village clinic as a hub. This village clinic primarily would be having an A&M, uh, a nursing graduate, a uh, mid-level health practitioner, and ASHA workers that we spoke about also reporting there. So that would take care of the, the preventive part. Now comes the curative part. The curative part would be dealing with uh, uh, the community, with uh, uh, district hospitals, the teaching hospitals, and the area, hosp area hospitals and the teaching hospitals are going to play a very critical role there. So there we are coming up with uh, uh, every parliament taken as a unit uh, we've, uh, uh, in order to ensure that there is equitable distribution of uh, teaching hospitals. Because only when you have, when you, only when you establish teaching hospitals, you have postgraduate students actually coming up there. And only when you have postgraduate students doing their course there, and these uh, teaching hospitals are connected to a, a hospital, a teaching hospital as well. So teaching college and teaching hospital together would become the tertiary care that, we're, that we are looking for. Okay. Aim and justification and more important, and the means to achieve it. I have developed a very clear-cut system of rules and principles. For the goals I have kept, and the profession I have chosen, and the life I want to lead. It is based on ancient, our scriptures, to put a check and minimize, or to an extent to cut down. It's, it is, Kama Krodha Loba Moha Madamatsiri. For my Sri Lankan and Bangladeshi friends to make you understand, it is a lust, a wrath, greed, infatuation, pride, and envy. I want to put a check on, minimize on this, because entire humanity, entire humans, lack of control on these things. The six core nature of our, uh, our nature so elements of our nature, this is where we had to put a check on it and to minimize it to succeed. And this is one. And second one is from Gandhiji. Politics without principle, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, knowledge without character, and commerce without morality, science without humanity, and worship without sacrifice. This is what my fundamental framework, I based on this. So within the, with the, this kind of framework, I was thinking how much it is really possible to, base on this, to, to, to be based on this framework and to move forward and to succeed, or to make a livelihood. It's quite difficult for me. And I was searching for answers in my life. I was truly searching for answers. I don't know how to be success, uh, successful. I don't know what to achieve. I never had the regular edu education like you because I was bored uh, going to schools and colleges. I taught myself. And I went to school. The questions, what I had, the questions I had, my teachers couldn't answer. So I came out, I, one day I told my parents, I said, I'm not going to study anymore because I'm not interested in the regular school uh, curriculum. So I walked out. And I pursued different kinds of uh, learning. Let it be music, let it be philosophy, uh, let it be logic and reasoning, let it be ethics. And I buried myself in books in search of answers, in search of to have a quality life, to have a better thinking, to be successful. But by the end of a few years, by the age of 22, 23, I ended up as a, a completely lost out. I don't know what I was doing with my life. And I was dependent on my family for my pocket money, to buy books, not for smoking or drugs or not, uh, not for drinks. Uh, but still I didn't like it, to be a dependent on my family members. So then it dawned on me, I should do something with, with my life. I have to make a, a livelihood. But whatever qualification I had, it's not very unconventional. So I don't know what to do. So finally, I was thinking, I was praying universe. I said, give me an opportunity, I don't know what to do with my life. 
So the reason is, why I'm saying it is, you're all prepared. You're all getting prepared, being prepared, you're under, under the preparation, some of you had prepared, are venturing out into life. Now an opportunity knocks on your door. And that opportunity which knocks on your door might not be up to your liking, might not be up to the expectation of yours. The same way, for me also, the kind of opportunity I was looking for and what, I, what knocked on my door was two different things. And cinema knocked on my door. So for us, uh, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, being a new state right now, we are looking at agile governance. It's about government being proactive and not reactive. So when you want to create a government, a government like this, this is where technology comes into place. The 4 IR comes into place. And drones play a very, very important role to give us real-time feedback. So there's no one project that we use it for. We use it across. So I've given you two examples. I can give you ten examples. But I know the best three minutes will come my way. So, you know, one example I'd like to share is Kia Motors is making its largest investment into in our Pradesh. And our chief minister, Mr. Naidu, wants to monitor this project and make sure that it's getting down on time. So every week a drone flies and gives him real-time feedback on what percentage of the construction is done. The other project we're using this for is Polar, which is a strategically important dam. This is where we're getting a lot of real-time feedback on what's the progress every week. So as decision makers, uh, you know, as ministers, as chief minister, we have the ability to take uh, real-time decisions. So we can actually add a completely new layer of data and data driven decision making. Now think about this application in agriculture. So the biggest challenge in agriculture is uh, knowing the quality of the soil. So the challenge is you take a sample, you send it to a lab, and by the time it comes back, the agri crop cycle is done. Because in India you have small and marginal farmers. So then take this to a drone. I mean, drone is a vehicle. We are just talking about it. It's just a vehicle, right? And you have uh, sensors on it that gives you real-time feedback. And then you link it with an app for the farmer. Voila, all of a sudden, it's real-time. He exactly knows the nutrition content. He knows what, what intervention he needs to do. And this can be transformative because he exactly knows the kind of nutrition that the soil needs, and not overdosing the soil. So in our state, the applications have just been you know, playing as a, as a platform, as, as a government's platform. We just have that thing. So adoption is on its way. I think you know, drones is going to be a way of life. It's no longer science fiction. Um, transporting blood, or transporting in, in human beings, it's going to be reality soon. I think as we discuss on the panel, uh, panel I think uh, battery endurance is going to be very, very critical. And our ability to do uh, long distance is going to play a very important role. So that's when I think adoption will really come into the next level. So, you know, in government, the biggest challenge you struggle is Okay, the drone goes in, has to come back, swap the battery again, again go in, come back. You're losing a lot of time and you're losing a lot of uh, manpower. That's expensive and precious. So that's why I think battery endurance would be a very, very critical role in the revolution against